Good evening, folks. Welcome back to Celtic Fans TV. We're live after Celtic's 3 3 draw with Rapid Vienna uh, for their second pre season friendly uh, so far. I've got Kenny with me tonight to go over the game. Um, Kenny, I quite enjoyed that as pre season friendlies go. I think it was a pretty decent one out. Yeah, I mean, it was certainly entertaining. There was certainly no shortage of committed uh, sort of tackles going on. It wasn't it wasn't quite the pedestrian pace you often <clears throat> suffer when you see these uh, pre-season friendlies. It reminded me a bit of how we played last at the start of last season in the respect that really slight going forward, really dangerous, but pretty, pretty uncomfortable viewing at the back. It's not nice to return to that. I was hoping that hopefully that's just down to rust and the fact that we're making some wholesale changes and it's not really a suggestion that we're going to be unsettled at the back going into the competitive action. But in the first half, I mean, what stood out for me, I thought Hattati looked sharp, just his touches on the ball, just the way he received the ball, the way he had his head up. I mean, he was he, it's a big season this for Hattati because he obviously had a spectacular start, a fade-off, which a lot of us aligned to, fairly aligned to the fact that he'd played a year and a half and he'd come from another continent. So this is a big year for him, and that's a good start, I think, based on how sharp he's looking it's lovely just to see Jota. You know what I mean? Jota didn't do anything overly spectacular in that first half, but it's just so validating to see him back in a jersey with some of the quality, just some of the touches. And that first goal was really impressive. I mean, Giamakis played a really important, I mean, it's quite a subtle contribution to that goal, but the way he just laid that ball off and the whole the whole thing opens up off the back of that. He's got a big decision to make this season post the Coglu in that that's what Giamakis gives you. It gives you that classic hold-up play that can open up in that first goal. We wouldn't have scored that first goal had Kyogo been on the park. But then in the second half, you see exactly what Kyogo gives you. Totally different, but the speed and the brain in behind. So he's got a big call to make. Whether the fact that Giamakis started in what looked like more or less his strongest 11 is an indication that he fancies Giamakis over, over Kyogo, I don't know. I think he probably will give Kyogo the nod, but a good contribution from Giamakis. Bearing the, uh, the left back, Argentinian left back, I was sort of looking out for... I thought he looked a little bit sort of unsettled. I mean, it's difficult to be too critical of a 21-year-old that's come in from South America, but I thought some of his sort of positional play was a bit weak. He didn't really get himself very far up the park either, so I would have liked to have seen at least a bit more of an offering from him, but it's very hard to sit here and be critical of someone who's probably just trying to find their bearings with, you know, personally, in, in the environment that they've come into, let alone play against a, you know, a reasonable, reasonable pedigree European side for the first time. So we'll wait and see. But overall, yeah, the whole, the whole thing was, it was interesting, wasn't it? It was, it was more, uh, a bit more exciting than probably what you would expect for, for many of these games. Yeah, absolutely. And it's still early doors, but a big, a big um, increase in terms of the quality opposition as well from Wednesday. Uh, Rapid Vienna finished fifth in the Bundesliga in Austria last year. Big stadium, decent enough crowd, um, totally different for the game on, on uh, Wednesday there. You, you, you talked about Hattati there. He was a standout for me in the first half on Wednesday. I thought in the first half again tonight, really good, as you say. Sharp on the ball. Some is, some is first touch passing, really, really good. That midfield three that we saw start tonight uh, of McGregor, Hattati and then O'Reilly, um, a lovely first goal. Um, I thought it was a beautiful strike. Do you think that that three uh, would be your first choice going into that Aberdeen game? It's t- well, McGregor definitely... O'Reilly definitely. It's whether or not Turnbull can make a case, but Turnbull, I mean, Turnbull's good in the second half, right? Nice mm. goal. He's got a good goal, yeah. N- great assist for the third goal. I mean, he's made that out of nothing, really, with his tackle. And we know that the quality that Turnbull can bring, it's another big season for him off his injury last season. What he doesn't give you that Hitati does is the sort of the more of the defensive side. You know, Hitati isn't an out and out defender, but he has at least got more legs than Turnbull. And I think if we're going into the likes of Champions League away games, I'm not going to have the luxury of playing Turnbull and O'Reilly. We might, you know, he might, uh, Postacoglu's pretty aggressive. He might do something like that at home. But if we're going to try and be realistic about competing in the Champions League, we're going to need to think with a, li- a little bit more defensively in the middle of the park. That probably results in a new signing. But in the absence of a new signing, yeah, I think that would be the three because O'Reilly has to start, McGregor has to start. And I think Hatati just gives you that little bit more of a number eight type role than Turnbull does, but Turnbull's breathing right down the neck of a lot of them, and, that, and that's mm. what's good. It wouldn't, it, it wouldn't, I, I don't th- I think not replacing Rogic might be a bit of a mistake. I mean, effectively, we're going to be playing with two number 
tens, if you like, for the majority of the season. We know that's how he wants to play domestically. He did it all last season, and that was fine because we had four people to handle it between Hatati, O'Reilly, Turnbull and Rogic. Trying to handle that with three people could be a bit of an issue. I don't like him pushing McGregor in there. I think McGregor's found his home at the six. So I think that probably is a starting three as it stands, but I believe we need to sign a, an anchoring midfielder to help McGregor out, particularly away from home in some of the higher profile games. You you mentioned already um, a couple of ropey bits defending. I think a few cobwebs uh, in both back fours, to be honest. Joe Hart in the first half had a couple of good saves, actually. A really good point-blank save um, from the header. But the goal, the goal's a poor, a poor one to lose in at Carter Vickers. Um, misplaces a pass and then it looks like Joe Hart's got it under control and he, he's, he's telling Bernabe to, to push out to receive the pass and then loses the tackle um, there's a few of the, a few of the bits tonight where you can tell uh, there's a few rusty players back there Yeah, I mean it was it was embarrassing really that goal, Vickers was a bit clumsy actually I mean Vickers yeah. barely put a foot wrong over the course of an entire 60 game season last year and he's, he's made more mistakes in 45 minutes there than he did he must have had a good holiday the entire time and you know, like, you've got to forgive them that you can't I don't know what Hart was thinking he just looked to be far, far too clump lackluster about the whole thing it was as yeah. if he had all the time in the world I mean it was pretty obvious to me watching it he was going to get, get tackled and, and likely to give himself a problem look Hart and Vickers were superb last season they've handled a lot greater pressure than Rapid Vienna in pre-season so I'm not too worried about that. It was just it was just a bit embarrassing. What was a bit more worrying for me was what, <clears throat> there seemed to be a return to a failure to deal with cross balls. Now, that haunted us for like two-thirds of last season. Mm. Starfelt and Vickers got that under control for the last sort of third of the season when we really had that solid push for the title. We weren't, we weren't looking vulnerable from cross balls, but it came back there in a bit of abundance. I mean, Hart was forced into a really excellent save early on from an aerial ball they scored at least one of their goals from a pretty basic header in the second half, albeit the defence in the second half isn't what we're going to play in competitive mm-hmm. action. But that that worried me a little bit. We looked really vulnerable from cross balls. Um, whatever centre-half pairing we put out there tonight looked um, as if they, you know, they'd never met one another. It, it wasn't great stuff. So let's hopefully we can just write that off to the sort of... <laughs> You know, random nature of uh, pre-season friendlies, but you know, you, you, you want to keep a bit of control back there before the game against Aberdeen. Yeah, um, I had that feel, didn't it? I, I always felt that Rapid Vienna were going to get a third equaliser. It just, it was one of the games, um, and then the corner comes in the last minute, and, and they do get it, and the referee blows for full time. Um, you can see though, going forward, very much like the the football we watched last season, very slick. <laughs> I think even on the counter attack, um, so some really good breaks forward, uh, a lot of chances created, and and three good goals. You can see the quality there um, with the front three in the, in the first half, as you mentioned, with Maeda, um, Jota, and Yakimakis. But then even in the second half, Abada, uh, Kyogo up there as well. And we touched on it in terms of midfield with the Hatati Turnbull um, sort of debate or, or conversation that we had. It's so good to have competition. The manager's got competition in most places in the pitch now and that's going to stand us in good stead this season. Yeah, because you've got to be playing at a really high level to hold those jerseys. Nobody, none of those people we've talked about, their jot is a high profile player, but he's, he's not guaranteed a start if he has a fall off for five or six games. And that's brilliant and that's across there in every position. We don't need to recruit any more wide players. There's a tenuous argument we need to recruit another 10. I think we maybe need to recruit a third striker I think it's a nice opportunity for us to bleed in a young striker who won't necessarily expect to start every week, but can come in. A bit like Edward did. When Edward came in, we had Moussa Dembele, we had Lee Griffiths just off a 40-goal campaign. There was no way Eddie was going to come in and start, but we knew we recognised it in time. It's a nice opportunity to bleed someone in. We're in that nice position now, so I would like to, to see us sign a sort of young, progressive striker that we can maybe give a five-year deal to and... and, and and build upon, but you're going to get so much out of Kyogo and Giamakis because they're going to be going at it. And the nice thing is they're completely different styles, as I already spoke about. We've got such strength and depth going forward that that's where we're really going to hurt teams this season. It will be nice to see if we can take that into the arena of the Champions League. Looking at the quality of it, I think we can. Now, are we going to cause real damage to teams like Real Madrid and Bayern Munich? 
like, let's be realistic, okay? We're not, we're, let's not be fanciful. But I think we can, I think we can make them think. I think if they come to Celtic Park and our offensive players are going at it in the way they do under Ange, there's, there's going, there's going to raise a few eyebrows, and that's that for me is going to be the really interesting thing about this season. We have saw how they can do it domestically. Can they take it to that next level? But I think all the ingredients are there to suggest that they're going to give it a good go. You mentioned a third-choice striker, so this is as good a juncture as any to ask you about the rumours that have appeared in the last week or so and again in the last couple of days. Um, what do you say to that third-choice striker being Jordan Larson? <laughs> I mean, I'm really... To- I, you know, I've thought about this a lot because I'm really torn about it. It could be a bit of a circus, right? It could be a bit of a sideshow. And Poster Coglu is so narrow-minded. He's so focused and he's built such a wonderful environment in the dressing room to disturb that. Not that Jordan Larson would come in like some prima donna and disturb it, but just to disturb it by having some sort of sideshow is something that you need to be very careful of. So that side of it makes me think, no. By the same token, maybe that's overthinking it. The guy is worth several million pounds. He's got a really good goal and assist rate in a harder league than ours. He's at a good age. The fans would love it. His dad, okay, the fact his dad's an icon is maybe something that will help him. He's familiar with these. You know, he's been brought up in the stadium as a child. Mm. I think on balance, I'd go for it. I wouldn't be going out and paying for him. I don't think I'd pay five, six million for him because I just think, A, we need someone who's going to be really happy sitting at the third choice. He'd need to ask himself that question. Would I be happy going from a pretty key role as starting striker in Russia to effectively starting this third choice for us in, in the Scottish League? He'd need to be prepared in his mind to accept that and work his way into the team. But I think purely on a, all things considered, and especially when you look at the economics of the free transfer, I would like to go for him mm. and bring him in because I think he's versatile as well. Isn't he? He's not just a bulldozer number nine. He can play along the front, and that's classic Postecoglou stuff as well. Mm. So I, I, maybe we don't need to overthink this one, and if we get the chance to get him in and get him over the line, because presumably our funds are a little bit thin now. You can't, and that's no fault of the board. They've spent almost twenty million, million pounds in June. That's and Celtic don't do that, right? They've yeah. they, they seem to have learned from the past of not building when you're strong, of not putting your foot in the accelerator when you know you've got you when you're at the top of the league. That's that's what that's what's cost. That's what made them crumble yeah. two years ago. So they've learned from that. But that being said, they probably don't have that much of an outlay. So I, w- I would say go for them. But what do you think? It's a tough call. It is tough. I think there's two very distinct camps. And I can see just glancing at the comments uh, on this video. I think there's people who think, uh, absolutely, we should never we should never bring him in. It's too much to live up to. As you say, it could become a, a bit of a, a circus. Maybe people constantly comparing him to his dad. But I think there's, there's another side of it where... We know that he's not his dad. He's never going to be as good as his dad. That's like we know that that that's playing for everybody to see. And I think he's a good player. And I think you could end up with a situation where he'd actually get more patience from a lot of supporters than than your average sort of random signing coming in because people have an affection for him because obviously they seen him as a kid running about the stadium and his dad is um, one of the greatest players to ever play for the club. Um, so I don't know. I, I I'd go for it. I think on a free transfer. We probably couldn't have afforded him. Um, I see a comment talking about we should have maybe went from before he went to Spartak and his value became too high for us. But if he's a free transfer and it's affordable and it works, and again, the the, the be-all and end-all for every signing is that the manager has to say he fits with what I want to do. And if he does that, then I think I think we should go for it. Um, I see Paul, Paul McLean there in the comments is saying deniers available on a Bosman. That would be a masterstroke if we could land him. I mean, he would be perfect for on a free Mm. That, that, that is exactly what we should be looking at if we can get a hold of him. I, I, I'd heard uh, a couple of people mentioning Denier uh, out of contract after leaving Leon. Um, yeah. He was good for us. I mean, if, if someone like that, I don't know if we could afford uh, his wage packet at this stage of his career, but um, that's I think, interesting. I think, I think, I think, I think, he'd make I think it stronger. what that, that 90 minutes tells you there is we need, we need centre-halves, right? You, yeah. we, we definitely need one. If resources and, and time tell you, you probably need a, a, another one. But we definitely need one, and we don't need one at the level of Welsh, no disrespect to Welsh, but we don't need one. We need someone that's going to keep Starfelt awake at night and think, hang on, I need to hold on to the jersey. Because at the moment, we're just Welsh in behind them and Julian looking pretty clumsy there. Starfelt and Vickers are under no pressure. They're the first names in the team sheet every week without any pressure. That's completely opposes all of those quality forwards we talked about. They are all awake at night thinking, I need to perform every week. 
So yeah. we need somebody in there who's not just there to make up the numbers, but somebody who's really going to pressurise them to become first choice. And that's a key piece of recruitment that we've still got to get right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to touch on this comment from Pauline Morphus, uh, the name just adds extra romance in terms of Jordan Larson. I and listen, I'm I'm quite romantic when it comes to football, so I think it'd be it'd be pretty cool if he fits for what the manager wants to do to have a have a Larson run about in a Celtic jersey again. Um, the second half, Kenny, the the whole team effectively changes apart for Urigidi. I think was the only one that uh, that stayed on because Ralston and Juranovic not involved tonight. Um, I'm not really sure why that was. I don't know if they've got niggles, um, but none of the two of them were even on the bench. Was there any standouts for you in the second half? Um, a lot of talk about um, Boston Lawell from the other night's game. I think him and Julian were a wee bit uh, ropey in the second half, uh, but also Idaguchi. Uh, have you had a chance to sort of form an opinion on Idaguchi yet? Not really, no. I thought he was pretty quiet there, not through any fault of his own. I mean, the match itself had got a touch of the pre seasons about it in the last sort of half hour. Um, he looks tidy, the Gucci. My only concern is I just think we're crying out for someone that's got more of a physique in there. I think if you look back to the Scottish Cup semi final, one of our biggest disappointments of last season, it was because we couldn't we couldn't match up physically. That Callum McGregor's a wonderful technical footballer, but occasionally there's a if you're playing with one man deep in the six, and he's and and, he, and, and there's a lot of physical pressure on him, that will tell. I, in my mind, I'm not sure the Gucci solves that. Based on very little other than the act, you know, he, he might he, he's like a nice understudy for McGregor, but I don't know if he necessarily starts in beside McGregor in the Champions League, for example. So still to be still to be really determined, but I think we need someone with just more of a. I mean, it becomes a bit of a cliche saying we need a Wanyama, right? We've been saying that ever since Wanyama left. We've never really had anyone like that, but that type of player would be the perfect fit, I think, at the moment to supplement the side in terms of. Do you know what? It's wonderful, Ange Ball. It doesn't rely on one yam as it relies on pure football. But from time to time, even the best teams in the world, they've got hard men in there that stand up for the side when they need it. And that, for me, is what's missing more than I need a Gucci. Um, but Ida Gucci, by all accounts, his attitude is brilliant and he's great in training. And I'm sure he is because of his background um, and, and, and the way Foster Coglo speaks of him. And in the second half, who stood out? Probably Lowell. I mean, he looked, like he looked to have a sort of physically a good presence about him. Him and Julian were all over the place. I don't really want. I don't think there's much value in us sitting trying to assess their performance. It's unfair on them and and probably not relevant to the, the you know the rest of the season. Turnbull looked sharp. Kyogo looked really sharp. Yeah. I mean that lovely movement. Or oh, uh, just to see Julian find him with a long range ball. You don't. Not something you would necessarily expect. But the way he assisted that first goal for Turnbull. Turnbull's late run. Really classic stuff for the two of them. And then just the way he held off. Nice to see Kyogo showing a bit of physicality on his second goal, actually. He held off his man using his body really well. And then and he just, when he turns, you know he's going to find the corner. He just knows he's going to find the corner. And, and that's what he does. So, yeah, I think we can be pleased with Kyogo looks right at it. So I'm looking forward to seeing him start uh, start the competitive. Yeah, that was a beautiful, a beautiful finish uh, for his goal. I'm so excited to see both uh, him, Hattati, in fact, all three of him, Hattati and Maeda, because they all effectively played a season and a half. And I think um, we've touched on Hattati already in terms of how sharp he looks. Kyogo as well tonight, the first glimpse of Maeda so far this season in the first half, um, this pre-season, sorry. I'm so excited to see those guys fully fresh, proper pre-season under their belt because what they showed last season was, was very promising, so you can only think that it can get better with a proper uh, full pre-season. Yeah, I mean, that is one of the most exciting things, because, I mean, you could argue we've had a great recruitment uh, so far. However, you've kind of stood still in that there's probably only maybe Burnaby, arguably, that might change the start in the living, although maybe even not. Mm. But So there's a, there's a question mark over whether have, are we just sort of standing still or in buying was it players that will sit in behind, but what what I think makes us guaranteed to improve next year is you're going to get another level out of those guys. Even if we do stand still, you won't stand still because they're going to perform at a level. I'm really confident they're going to perform at a level above what they brought up last season just because they're human beings and they'll be used to the city. They've had a good break. And even tonight, I just felt, even maybe it's just psychological, but just watching the Tati Maeda, they, you felt more at home watching them and they looked really comfortable in the system. They looked sharp, they looked quick. And I think we're going to get a lot out of the Japanese boys this season that could hopefully take us on to a level where we can at least 
try and be somewhat competitive at the highest level of the game, which is the Champions League, which is what we're all excited about. So, yeah, I think I think that continuity, it doesn't, the second season doesn't always result in success. Brendan Rodgers went an invincible treble yeah. and then had a big drop off in the second season. Yeah. Where I think it's different this time is, and they recovered that and they won a double treble, but it was a worrying for a while. But where I think the difference this time is, we've got loads of people on new contracts, but a lot of these players will be here six months. It's really unique that you've got a group of players who've just won the league and have, are still just really fresh into their contracts and that hunger that they've got to play for Celtic is still there. That, you know, that they don't have people you know, from uh, the English Premier League swarming around them yet because they haven't necessarily proven over time that they deserve a huge transfer. So all of those ingredients make, I believe, this second season, I'd love to see, I think we're going to be 100 points this season. I can see that. I can just think it's got it written all over it. It's whether or not Rangers can sort of cope with that. Uh, and, and matches stride for stride, but I don't really have any doubt. I would believe we are going to breach 100 points this season domestically because we're not going to have that clumsy start and it's going to be pretty difficult to take points off us. I hope so. I hope so. Um, obviously, as we go through these pre-season fixtures, they'll gradually get sort of more difficult and we'll see something that looks a lot more like the, the first choice 11 you would expect as, as we get closer to that first game against Aberdeen. We've we've maybe mentioned this a couple of times throughout, but what else do you think we need, and and how many more do you think we'll get in before that that first game against Aberdeen, if any? I think if it was an order of priority, centre back, I think I, I was a bit worried watching that preseason friendly there. Uh, you know, it could we conceded three, we could have conceded six, easy. We can just write that off as rustiness, but you shouldn't ignore that when you're three weeks away from your first competitive game. Missing Starfelt too, though. Missing Starfelt, yes. but And we need someone else to, in to help McGregor. We've already discussed the reasons why. I don't need to go over that. But then thirdly, I think we do need a third-choice striker. Someone that's... And, and that piece of recruitment's quite specific because you can't just go in and get anyone. You, get, you need to get someone who's young, someone who's happy to stay in behind third choice, someone who you think is going to be able to develop into, you know, and, and in the classic way that Edward did when he came in as a third-choice striker... But that's a nice position to be in. Last season, we were, be, we were just desperately trying to get anybody to fill any position, and we ended up signing 17, somehow won the league. But to, have, to be faced right now with three pieces of recruitment and three players that will probably come in as reserves, I think is a nice position to be in. I think we've learned a lesson. I think Michael Nicholson deserves a bit of credit, actually, yeah. in terms of... We don't talk about him much because he sits in the background. But since he's walked into the door, he wasn't even walked into the door, he was thrown in, into the position... Everything's gone right, or, or both on and off the park. Even off the park, all the sort of online content is great. He's great with us, the fan media. The you know the club are brilliant. Was there's real harmony between the fans and the support. All of the recruitment is right on the money. The length, the contracts. I'm yeah. sure it wasn't that easy to try and get Jota to sign a five year deal, and he's done that. Right, it's not that easy to get somebody like Jovanovic to sign a, a five year deal. So I think the board deserve a bit of credit, actually, in terms of how they've turned the club around and the fact that their transfer activity, they seem to have learned a lesson from the Brendan Rodgers days when they realised that trying to support the manager in the last week of August isn't good enough. It needs to be done in June. And they're doing everything in the right way. So we're in nice shape. But I do think we still need three signings. Whether Maybe we need to use the loan market. We've now got no loans. That's fine. Get in a couple of loan options to buy. You can get high, high quality in without a big outlay and you can take a look at them. So maybe that's another market as well. Yeah, and we've seen the value of that last season, didn't we, with Carter Vickers and Jota. Um, it's almost like a trial period where the, the, the big outlay for the club this this summer in terms of their permanent fees, the, the risk is totally mitigated because they've been here for a year and you've seen that they've excelled in, in this team and under this manager. Yeah, so. And you get them for cheap relatively. I mean, 12 million quid for the two of them is not cheap, but it would have cost you 25 million now had you not yeah. prearranged that in the contract. So there's no downsides to the loan to buy. Yeah, I think Benfica were actually really disappointed. They ended up only getting six and a half million for Jota because if that clause wasn't there, they, they'd have commanded a much higher fee from, from other clubs for him. Yeah. Yeah. And the same yeah. with Vickers, right? I mean, Vickers for six, because they're at a good age. Then you they're in, you know, Vickers has just been capped for you'll probably go to the World Cup and his value goes up overnight. So mm. that 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 of, of of everything since the end of last season, the most satisfying thing is getting Jota and Vickers in. Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and as you say, let's hope there's more to come. Kenny, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you all for watching. Like this video, comment with your own thoughts on tonight's game below. 
And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. We will see you again during the week for the next Friendly. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.